me a second and let's test. Rod Bryant, Houston, Texas, USA. To everyone, Tess, can you hear this? Yeah, I can hear it. <laughs> okay, so Cheyenne, to everyone. Oh, oh no, no. <laughs> covering eyes. Watch you covering eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens? You say something snide in class. Remember, everybody's going to hear it. So keep your opinions <laughs> to yourself unless it's a. And when he asks questions, you can ask it at the end. He can hear it. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. I so, can't turn Rod, chat off. Could you could you enable it? That I've been in part of Zooms where the instructor sets it up that all, everyone can only message them privately, and that might take care of it. So, hmm. like that oh, way, okay. at least stops it, so it's not interrupting <laughs> Rabbi. Okay. Now I got to figure. Now I got to figure out that. Okay. So give give me a bit. I have work to do. Thank you. I'll figure it out. Rabbi, you're on your own. Okay. Uh, I was on mute. I see almost everyone. Okay, let's begin. Today, the plan, uh, please God, is to do the next uh, mitzvah and mishnah in our series. I know I've been promising to do the next Messiah, um, the Messiah installment. Um, it's still pending. So I hope to do it um, in next week, following week. Um, I haven't forgotten about it. I promise. Um, but I want to do it properly. I want to kind of navigate the next transition in our study of Messiah properly. Uh, so we'll hold off a little bit on that until it's ready. I don't want to give you like, a, you know, cookies that are not fully baked or bread that's a little bit underdone. Nothing half baked. So I want to make sure that it's fully baked and developed. And uh, I know uh, how we're going to approach it. So you'll forgive me for that. But we have an uh, exciting uh, mitzvah and mishnah, so let's begin. We are up to mitzvah number 132, and today we're going to do 132 and 133. And like the previous mitzvah 131, which was the removal of the ashes from atop the altar, this one also, these two also relate to the altar. Number 132 is an obligation to always maintain a steady fire atop the altar. And 133 is the prohibition against extinguishing the fire from atop the altar. So you have to have a fire there at all times. Day and night, there's a fire atop the altar. Whether or not there are sacrifices that need to be processed, as we shall see. And that cannot be extinguished. Mitzvah number 132 and 133. As a practical matter, this means that we have to add wood and logs to the pyres, as they're called, atop the altar, morning and night. Now, the Sefer Chinuch, he tells us that there's something very unusual about this mitzvah. The sources and the tradition tells us that there was a miracle in the temple and in the tabernacle that there was always a divine fire from heaven upon the altar. In the first temple, the fire from heaven was in the shape of a lion, and in the second temple, it was in the shape of a dog, but there was always a divine fire atop the altar. Well, if there's a fire, why do you have to add a fire? So he quotes our sages to tell us that even though there's a heavenly fire, there's a mitzvah to, suppl to, there's a mitzvah to supplement the heavenly fire with a human-made fire as well. Now, it is interesting, just as a side note, the Midrash tells us that when they moved, when the tabernacle, when they relocated, they had to decamp and travel, and they took apart the whole tabernacle, and they traveled, the heavenly fire was still on the altar as it was mobile. And Rashi in Parshas Bamidbar, the end of Parshas Bamidbar, tells us that they would cover the altar with a special cloth to protect it when it was in transit. And what did they do with the heavenly fire that descended upon the altar? The human fire, we can remove that. When you travel, you take off the fire. 
But the heavenly fire continued even when they traveled. So Rashi tells us that the fire that was crouching like a lion, they would cover it with a special vessel to protect the cloth shouldn't be singed, shouldn't be burned. But there was always a heavenly fire. Open, one of three, tab control, room, one of two, tab control, room, one of two, tab control. I wasn't the only one that heard that, right? I heard it too. I have no idea what that is. I think I blocked the feature of chat, so. Okay. It's getting a mind. It's, it's that AI. It's getting its own mind. <laughs> I don't trust this. Okay, Rabbi, sorry. But there was always a fire atop the altar. And even though there's a heavenly fire, there's a mitzvah to also place a human-made fire as well. Now, the Sefer Chinuch, he notes something very unusual about this mitzvah. The altar was used to process sacrifices. What do you need to do to make a sacrifice? Well, you need a lot of things. You need a sharp knife to do the slaughtering. You need all sorts of vessels to process it. And you also need a fire. So why is there a standalone mitzvah to have a fire atop the altar when we have many, many mitzvahs that relate to sacrifices? And the sacrifices mandate that you have a fire. So why is there a separate mitzvah to have a fire even outside of its requirement, its utility to process the sacrifices? And he tells us, and this is one of the major themes of this mitzvah, that yes, Aside from the requirement of fire to process the sacrifices, there is a standalone mitzvah to have a fire at all times atop the altar. So this is the positive mitzvah, mitzvah number 132, to have a fire. And then 133 is just the flip side of that, the prohibition not to extinguish the fire from atop the altar. You cannot remove even a single ember from the fire atop the altar. It's a very serious prohibition. In fact, the halacha states that like many of the prohibitions in the Torah, if someone violates them and it's done in front of witnesses, they could be brought to court and actually be caned, receive lashes for their violation. If someone were to remove even a single ember from atop the fire, the, the fire atop the altar, that would be a violation of mitzvah number 133, and they would be lashed if the requirements do so are in place. Now, the Sefer Chinuch does tell us that there were times where we would take some fire from atop the altar. So, for example, we had previous mitzvah that you would take some ashes, some coals from atop the altar. Once you remove it, then it's no longer considered the fire of the altar, and if you were to extinguish it, it would not be a violation. Similarly, the menorah. How do you light the menorah? They would take a fire from atop the altar. Once you remove the fire from atop the altar for the purposes of lighting the menorah, it's no longer considered the fire of the altar, and therefore this prohibition does not apply. Okay, so we have this mitzvah, this idea, you have to have a fire atop the altar at all times, and you cannot extinguish it. And the Sefer HaChinuch has a very fascinating essay where he talks about the reason for this mitzvah. And of course, we always remember, this is not the actual reason, but this is an idea that can help bring the concept of the mitzvah, bring it down to our level so we can understand it. And he says a few very interesting things. The first thing he tells us is that there is a protocol for miracles. How are miracles done? A miracle, by definition, is a suspension of nature. You have a whole system of nature, and then comes a little miracle, and it's a departure from the rules of nature. The water typically... Ashley entered the waiting room. Close. Admit. View. Press CMD plus U to manage the waiting room. Somehow I was made, I was made a host. So now they asked me, uh, did you hear that? I don't know if you heard that. You did hear that? Okay, this is like, uh, 
the, 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 everything that can go wrong with the Zoom is going wrong. <laughs> this has to do with new features. I'm reading them now. It's ridiculous. Okay. Uh, okay, let's continue. So you have water, and the water is just always flat, right? Maybe there's some waves, but it's always flat. And then you have a miracle where suddenly the water split, and the Jews are able to walk in the dry land amidst pillars of water on either side. That is a departure from the normal rules of nature. But when miracles happen, they're always done in a way that minimizes the suspension of nature. And it allows the onlooker to say, well, maybe, maybe, maybe it wasn't a miracle. So for example, when the sea split, this is what he tells us, the example that he features. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 21, the verse talks about what happened before the splitting of the sea. There was a strong wind. And it was a fierce wind the whole night. It was like a tsunami. It was like a hurricane. And sometimes it's a feature of cataclysmic weather events. Sometimes the waters just leave the shore and they just leave the sea. And that allows the onlooker to view the miracle as if it was just a natural phenomenon. And that's the rule. Miracles are always minimized. And therefore... We, the Glock, entered the waiting room. Close, admit, view. Press CMD plus U to manage the waiting room. David Block entered the waiting room. Close, admit, view. Press CMD plus U to manage the waiting room. I would have heard that again. I'm deleting that chat function, guys, for right, right now. Okay, listen, I, I'm going to, everyone heard that as well on their computer, just heard it from mine. We heard it also. We, we all, we all yeah, heard it. Heard it. I'm going in to, to turn off the chat. Where is it at now, Matt? Show me. Uh, I think it's. Um, I think it says viewers can see chat, and I turned that off. So let me see if that works. Can you change it that uh, I'm I'm changing only you're the host? Yes. And also uh, I'm turning off all the chat features for right now until we figure it out. So you should be okay now, I think. Let's continue. <laughs> And therefore, given that we have this policy that the Almighty always minimizes the miracle, we are encouraged to do the same. And therefore, if the Almighty gives a steady miracle that a heavenly fire always appears atop the altar, it is incumbent upon us to do what we can to minimize the miracle. And therefore, says the Zebra Chinuch, we have a mitzvah to always have a fire that is of human origin atop the altar, and therefore the miracle of the heavenly fire is not as pronounced. And then he adds, the heavenly fire was almost always invisible. There were some exceptions. There were a few times where there was a heavenly fire, for example, in the eighth day of the inauguration, on, on the first day when Moshe handed over the reins of the tabernacle to Aaron and his sons, this is the first day of Nisan, so almost a year after the Exodus, the verse tells us, I think this is in chapter 12 or 13 or something like that, of Leviticus, that a fire descended from heaven. Everyone saw it. 
that was a departure. There was always a fire from heaven, but most often it was invisible. Now, continues the Sefer HaChinuch in his essay, and he asks a very sharp question. He says, wait a minute. Why is there a need to have a fire at all times? After all, the reason why you need a fire is to elevate the sacrifices. Of course, every sacrifice has a different set of protocols. Some are burned entirely. Some, a portion of it is given to the Kohen. Some, a portion of it is given to the Kohen and to the owners. But there's always a part of it that is going to be placed upon the altar. And therefore, the fire, it's effectively a means to process the sacrifice. So if this mitzvah was only, the idea behind the mitzvah was only to minimize the miracle, well, then that would only be needed for sacrifices. There would be, be no requirement to have a steady fire at all times. We have a special mitzvah to have a fire even when it's not being used to process the sacrifices. And the example that we gave earlier would apply. You need to have a sharp knife to do a sacrifice. Yet there's no mitzvah in the Torah to have sharp knives. It's part of what you need to facilitate the mitzvah, but it's not a standalone mitzvah. So therefore, this idea that we're trying to minimize the miracle, it would not suffice for this mitzvah entirely. And then he says something very interesting. He says a few very, very interesting fundamental principles. He tells us that a person can be a receptacle of divine blessing that can then permeate the entire world. And he recalls what he said in Mitzvah number 97. Mitzvah number 97 relates to the showbreads. And he said over there that the reason why we have breads in the temple is because everything in the temple received divine blessing. And if you want to have divine blessing in bread, in grain, in sustenance, in nourishment throughout the world, you have to have a foothold of that in the temple. And therefore, there was bread, 12 showbreads in the temple. And because there was bread in the temple, those breads received divine blessing. And once the blessing found a foothold in the temple in bread, that can then cascade outwardly to all the other breads in the world. And thus, the showbreads served as a means to receive divine blessing in all food worldwide. You have to have something that the blessing can grab a foothold in. And once it's there, it could spread to everything of its type. And the bread of the showbreads that serves as a receptacle of the divine blessing for bread. And once you have a bread in the temple that is full, replete with divine blessing, from there it could spread to all other breads. Says the Sefer Chinuch, just as we want blessing in bread, we want blessing in fire. We want there to be fire at all times in the temple because fire needs to have a blessing. And the word that he says is an incredible line. There has to be a mitzvah in fire in the temple because all humanity has fire within them, like fire in your belly. And we want the fire, the dynamism, the energy that is present in all humanity to be blessed. And therefore, you have to have a fire in the temple. And once there's a fire in the temple, there's blessing in that fire in the temple. And once there's a blessing in the fire in the temple, that can spread to all other fires. And in every person, in all of humanity, the fire that we have within us will be blessed thanks to the fire that's atop the altar. Incredible idea. Why do we have the fire on the altar? So he gives us one idea, and that is we want to minimize the miracle and the fire that we use to burn the sacrifices, we want to have that obscured, and therefore we supplement the fire that comes from heaven with our own human fire. And then he says this incredible idea that there's another reason why 
we need the fire, not to burn the sacrifices per se, because after all, it's at all times, even when there are no sacrifices to process. Two in the afternoon, all the sacrifices are done. The Kohanim are on a break. The sacrifices will not suffer if the fire is extinguished. Sacrifices come and you start a new fire, no big deal. But we want fire just for the sake of the fire because we want blessing and fire. And once there's blessing and fire in the temple, that can permeate, that can spread to the fire within every person. Now, Sefer Chinuch elaborates on this idea. What is the nature of this fire within man? So he talks about the idea of energy, the idea of movement, the idea of vitality and dynamism. The fact that we have an engine that drives us, that we have momentum, that we have action, that we have dynamism, that is what is indicative of the fire within us. And it's important for it to be blessed. Because if someone has too much fire, they could be very angry. They could be in danger. They could have fever, what he says. And if someone has too little fire, they'll be sluggish. They'll be lethargic. They'll be weak. And therefore, you have to have blessing in the fire. The right amount of excitement and dynamism and action. The right amount of fire in your belly, but not too much. You need the Goldilocks zone. No more, no less. And therefore, you have to have the fire be blessed. Too much fire, it's destructive. Too little, there's not enough vitality. And therefore, you need blessing and fire in the world. And therefore, you have blessing in the fire in the temple. A beautiful idea. Number one, the idea that miracles are obscured. Number two, that we all have some fire, some energy, some dynamism that drives humanity. And it needs a blessing. It needs to be properly balanced. Not too much and not too little. And for that reason, we have this unusual mitzvah that totally independent of the utility of the fire to process sacrifices, there is a mitzvah to have a steady fire atop the altar at all times. Now, as he always does, now, as he always does, the Sefer Chinuch provides us a sampling of mitzvos, And he tells us that logs were added to the fire in the morning, two in the morning, two at night, in the afternoon, late afternoon. And there are different fires, not just one big fire atop the altar. There are three different fires. The biggest one was the one that you offered all the sacrifices in. The second one was a small one next to the large one. And that is the, the source fire for the ketores, for the incense. And the third one, there was a third fire atop the altar that was never, ever used. It was just a fire. And it was not used for anything besides for this mitzvah, mitzvah number 132 and 133, to always have a fire atop the altar. Now, I will tell you that in a Parsha podcast about a year and a half ago, I spoke about in Parsha Tzav, that's the second Parsha in the book of Leviticus, I spoke about this mitzvah. And I suggested another approach as to why we have this fire at all times atop the altar, even if it's not being used to process sacrifices. I think it's a nice idea. I would like to suggest it here as well. We know that a mitzvah could be the byproduct of a, of a given set of factors. You have to have an opportunity to do the mitzvah. You have to have the ability to do it. You have to have the drive to do it. And you have to execute upon your desire to do the mitzvah. I wanted to suggest that when you have a fire atop the altar, what does that mean? It means that you are always ready should the opportunity arise to do a sacrifice, to do service for the Almighty, you are always ready for it. Suppose it's two in the afternoon and there are no sacrifices. 
Just as there is a mitzvah to do a mitzvah, there's a mitzvah to be ready to do a mitzvah as well. And therefore, there's a standalone mitzvah to say that's not just the mitzvah itself that is the mitzvah, to be ready, to be prepared, to be ready to pounce on the opportunity to do the mitzvah, that in itself is also a mitzvah. As an example of this, the sources note that when Moshe has his prophecy, his initial prophecy at the burning bush, the verse highlights the fact that Moshe noticed it and he turned and he went. He kind of engaged with the site that was before him, the burning bush that's not being consumed. And the commentaries there say that Moshe was ready for this moment. Yes, there was the opportunity, but he was also prepared for it. And the commentaries tell us that he sees the opportunity, he sees the moment, but had he not seized the moment, had he not been ready, he would not have been selected. All of the giants, all of our heroes are ones that accomplish great things. But they don't accomplish great things because they have more opportunities to accomplish great things. What really separates the giants, the heroes, from the lay people is the readiness, is the preparation, is the getting in position, positioning themselves to be ready to pounce an opportunity that does arise. The fire of the giants was always lit. If you have an opportunity and you're, you're struggling, where's the fire? Let's get ready. It's too late. You'll miss it. And you never know when a golden opportunity may present itself. And therefore, we have this mitzvah, which again, we're applying it more globally. You always have to have some fire atop the altar, ready to grab onto the opportunity that may arise. We never know when the opportunity will show. But when it does, if you have a fire lit, if you are ready, if you are in position, if you've done all the preparatory work to get ready for that moment, you'll be able to grab it. Otherwise, you'll be scrambling for the fire, so to speak, and you can't just turn it on instantly, and you may not be able to grab the opportunity that may show up. So maybe that's another idea for this concept of the fire atop the altar. Mitzvah 132, to always have a fire. 133, to never extinguish it. There's always a fire atop the altar in the temple. And this is mitzvah number 132 and 133, to have a fire atop the altar. And this fire, once it was lit, it stayed lit for days and weeks and months and years and centuries. You will notice in a lot of uh, shuls next to the ark, that's where they keep the Torah scroll. A shul is almost like a, it's called, it's called a mini temple. A mikdash me'at, a small temple. They have a light atop the ark and it's, it's called a ner tumid, a, a steady fire. And that is indicative, that it is reminiscent of this mitzvah. There's always got to be a fire. Of course, we don't have a temple today, but please, God, when the temple is rebuilt, we will have a steady fire from then on out. 132, 133, to have a fire atop the altar. Okay, I'll, I'll pause for questions here. Uh, anyone wants to chime in? Welcome Just to a the comment, so Robert, Rabbi? Sure, sure, go ahead. That's what Rod was talking about before the class is that he was going to take those kids to um, appointments, you know, things like that, that is getting prepared to do the mitzvah. Yes. yes. Anything that someone does to prepare for a mitzvah, to always be ready for it, that um, that was the idea, one of the themes that we want to take away from this mitzvah. To always be ready. Not just yeah. when the mitzvah shows up and try to, you know, always be in the bullpen, ready for it. To always be in the bullpen. Or carrying money in the car to give to the who are begging. King Wood. TX hand has been raised. Raised hand. Sandy Wells. Uh, King Wood. Uh, TX raised hand. Close view. Press CMD plus to open pop up. Raised hand. Sandy Wells. King Wood. 
TX raised hand. Okay, I'm, I'm going to solve this for everyone. CMD plus <laughs> pop up. Sandy Wells, King Wood, All right, I am hand so has sorry. been lowered. Sandy, it's your fault. So oh, sorry. <laughs> Rabbi, I have to say, I, I loved your class. Wait, everyone and, oh, heard that on their computer? Yes. Yes, unfortunately. Okay. Rabbi, I have to say, I love your classes always. I mean, I love your insights always, always. So you always know that that's a given. But, but. because, no, this is a good but. This is an added but. What you went through in this class, and because of me, and I am an older person with, you know, it's, it's hard to keep your brain focused on a thread of, of, of conversation, right? You were interrupted so many times. You picked up where you left off. I am so impressed. I just, I admire you. Thank you for that. That was really good. Well done. Thank you. Okay, Thank everybody, you. just one time, blame me. Just go ahead and no, say No, I'm not saying it's your fault, Rod. <laughs> I okay, am just uh, saying. Rod, Rod, this is what you It shows how good he is. I know. That's Rod, it. Yes, Rod, sir. Do you have uh, the Zoom, um, the Zoom desktop? Uh, I, yeah, I, I'm looking all through it right now, my settings, and I have not go found settings. Go the to little the settings. thing that says accessibility with the little man. Cannot okay. find it. I, I will show you where to do it. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see if I have it over here. Now, you're not talking about where we're actually seeing the Zoom video. You're talking about online on my Zoom.us account. Yes. My main. Okay. That's where I'm at. Okay. You have started a screen share. Do you see my, my screen? Yes, I've seen that too. Okay. So you yes. click this little button. What little button? This one. Settings. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I don't see that, but I know what you're talking about. Let me go yeah, like a little gear, screen. a little gear that has settings. And it says general video, audio, share screen, et cetera. All in the bottom says accessibility. Okay, so let me exit my And then it has screen. over here screen reader alerts. I believe this is it. Screen reader alerts. It's under settings, right? It's under settings. You want to find that little, the little gear icon and then unclick all of them. I think because you're screen the Screen reading, what's it called again? Screen reader alerts, but the tab on the left here is accessibility. You see that? Rod, do you see I, his same screen? Because did you? I, no, I don't see anything on his thing. Okay. He's sharing his I'm, desktop, you, not the Zoom. The it won't share I, the Zoom. Okay. When I did that with a friend, when I had, Stop when I went share. in through, you got to go in through Safari and not the Zoom app, and you might then see the same thing. I'm uh, I'm on the Safari right now. No, oh, okay, no, never use mind. the Zoom app. I, I I'm I'm taking the other approach here. Oh, okay. use the Zoom app. Okay, on your desktop, right? And it has uh, a little gear. So uh, on top, you see it says meeting and mail and calendar and team chat. You see that? And contacts. Do you see that? No, this is, yes, got it. Yes? Got okay. it. Okay. And then in the middle, uh, and then. Yeah, I'm there. I'm there. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got you it. see okay. the little deer. It's a small little deer right in the middle of the screen. Already there. Now I need to mute all these things. Okay. I see participants joined. So go. Host only, host only, audio mute by host. Let's see. All the way down, right? Screen. Re yeah. You want to look on the left tab and find accessibility and go to the bottom screen reader alerts. Okay. And that's what it is. I'm here. So I'm like a millennial. I should be able to know how to do these things. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you are practically a millennial. No, I actually am a millennial. Oh, I'm a baby boomer. So yeah, I get to like, I get to say, what the heck's going on here? I can't understand anything. Closed caption available. Yes, we want that to be closed caption type. No, no, of we don't want it to be read on the screen, though. No, we don't. So, so we, we will point out that a baby boomer invented the internet. Yeah, I you will not hear a bad word about me from the, about the baby boomers. Yeah. I love the baby boomers. And also across the top of my screen, right next to the, um, right next to the recording, I see that it says a participant has 
enabled closed captioning. Well, I'm fine with that as long as it doesn't read it out loud. Right, it's only so reading it to her. Yeah, just adding data. I will not besmirch the boomers. Gen X, yes. Millennials, yes. Gen Z, absolutely. Not the boomers. Both my parents are boomers. Yeah, uh, that's right. Aaron Lou, I don't know if we finished your comment there. We kind of got a little uh, torpedoed by <laughs> something that was read on the screen. We're going to have to test it, though, before we go, okay, because I'm clicking stuff here. So am I testing it? Is that what I'm doing here? No, no, I just want to make sure that you finished your comment. Oh, there was just the other thing is that, you know, when you, you put money in the car so that when somebody's yeah. at the side of the street, you're preparing for the mitzvah. Yeah, yeah. And I, I assume it's also psychologically getting ready. You know, think about all the opportunities that may arise that day. Absolutely, yeah. Good, thank you. I know how to spot it. <laughs> Great class. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, Sandy, you had your hand raised, I was told. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Shall I try again and see if that happens? Yeah, let's again? see what happens. Put it on. Okay, we'll see what happens. Hold on. I didn't hear anything. Yay! I'm okay. victorious. So my question is, uh, when the third temple is built, you said the fire will be, be will have the fire again? Well, yeah, well, will that good. initial fire come back down from heaven like it did originally, or will somebody right. have to start it? I, I I think I think it will. It will come from heaven. Yes, because the the um the Talmud tells us that even the second temple, it was much lower level. There was still a heavenly fire. It was not like a lion. It was like a dark. That's what we're told. But the third temple is going to be the permanent temple, it's supposed to be greater even than the first temple. The first temple was destroyed. So the second temple was destroyed. The third temple will not be destroyed, and therefore it, it's going to be a much higher level. And therefore, I would imagine if even the second temple that was the lowest temple that we've had, if that had a divine fire, certainly the third temple will. So I've never seen that source, but I would imagine that that would be true. And again, there'll still be a mitzvah for us to bring, you know, the uh, a human fire as well. Thank you, Rabbi. So yes. in many aspects, Rabbi, our mitzvahs is the sustaining fire that affects the world around us today, like the today, fire today, on the altar. We don't have, today, we right. don't have uh, the, the fire of the temple, so we have to right. find alternatives. But that's true with many, many different things that right. were present in the temple that we don't have the ability to actually do it today. We um, have to find alternatives. Nancy had her hand up. Nancy. Hi, Rabbi. Um, yeah. You were talking about the fire that's within us. Yes. Does that have anything to do with the candle on the head when we're in the womb uh, interesting what an interesting suggestion um so the candle on the head just to um uh, explain what nancy is saying the the midrash and the talmud talk about how the the child in utero has a candle on their head this is kind of how i start my book with the candle on the head um now, what, what does the candle represent and why is it on the head? And, um, and then it gets extinguished or it gets um, immer immersed, uh, so, you know, so submerged in the in the child at birth. So, um, you know, that represents the soul and the fire, the, the, the dynamism. So I, I would imagine that it does. He doesn't say it explicitly, um, but it, it, it seems to me, we know that when someone doesn't have a soul within them, they don't have the vitality. They don't have the movement. They don't have energy. They don't have dynamism. So it would seem to be that it's one of the same. But I think it's he's also referring to it in a in not as much of a, a spiritual sense. Uh, he talks about how uh, someone who has too much fire can have a fever. So I would say that you know, if someone has too much of a soul, that's a good thing. So I would say it's that, but it's also it's that plus. He does mention, I didn't mention this earlier, but does mention that the sons of Aaron had too much of a fire. And that's why they took too much action. And that's why they brought the unauthorized fire and they were and they were killed. So I would say it's probably uh, related, certainly adjacent to that idea of the candle on the head that gets immersed in a person or gets submerged in a person. Very, very interesting connection. Yeah. Anyone else wants to chime in before we jump to the Mishnah?
Okay, we're going to jump to the Mishnah. Um, a lovely, lovely Mishnah. I'm very excited to study it with y'all. Um, let us begin. And just as I start, I hear the, the guy cutting the grass here. You don't hear it. You don't hear it. No, you're fine. <laughs> it's that superb microphone you have. No, I'm just using the, the, the laptop microphone. Really? The <laughs> microphone that I'm using. Yeah, the microphone I'm using, it. that's just for the podcast. But oh, it's, it's for show, right? <laughs> and yeah, for you, it's just for show. No, uh, don't hear it. So you're good. Okay, great. <clears throat> Let's begin. We are about halfway through the 48 ways to wisdom. This is again in chapter six, Mishnah number six of Perke Avos, of Ethics of the Fathers. And this is the comprehensive list of what we need to do to acquire Torah and more broadly to acquire wisdom as well. And way number 24 is Be'emunas Chachamim, which literally translates as having emuna, having faith in Chachamim in the sages. And as always, we're going to try to understand what that means just in isolation. What does it mean to have trust, to have faith in the sages? A. B. We're going to try to understand how that contributes to, towards the achievement of wisdom. And we're going to start with that in, in general. What does it mean to have faith, to have trust in the sages? A, and B, we'll try to apply that to the pursuit of wisdom. Now, if you think about it, it's a bit of a foreign concept. The term amuna. What does amuna mean? Amuna means faith, belief. We have faith in God. What is this idea that we can have faith in a sage, faith in a man? So you'll notice there are, or at least there's one person in the Torah that we have faith in. When Moshe comes and he's coming to rescue the Jewish people and he performs some signs to the elders of the Israelites, the verse tells us, this is in chapter 4 of Exodus, the people have faith. They believe him. Later on in chapter 14 of Exodus, this is after the splitting of the sea, right before the song at the sea, the verse tells us, Vaya'aminu bahashem, they believed in Hashem, they had emuna in Hashem, u v'moshe avdo, and in Moshe, his servant. Again, the people have faith, have emuna have trust in Moshe. Finally, in Exodus 19, right before the Sinai revelation, God tells Moshe, the reason why we're having the Sinai revelation is so that the nation hears when I speak to you. So the nation listens into the conversation that I have with you. And also in you, in Moshe, they will forever believe. So we have this notion of faith in Moshe. The nation does display emuna, faith in Moshe. Of course, this is not blind faith, mindless faith. Moshe did signs. There was a splitting of the sea. God spoke to him and we listened in. It was faith born out of evidence, out of testimony. But they do harbor faith in Moshe. Why is it important for us to have faith in Moshe? So the obvious answer is that, well, Moshe is a prophet. And prophecy is necessary for us. Do you hear it now? You don't hear it? Mm -mm. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> I think it's the leaf blower. Rabbi, you're being tested today. I think that uh, there's like uh, some software that's designed to you know, quiet out all the other sounds so you don't hear nothing. It's amazing. Okay, where were we? So the basic idea here is that Moshe is a prophet. And part of our system of religion is to believe that the Almighty speaks to prophets and he conveys his will via his prophets. In fact, in the 13 principles of faith, we have a principle to believe in prophecy. And there's a very iconic Rambam that we've talked about many times. Whenever we get a chance to revisit this Rambam, we love to. 
In the laws of the foundations of the Torah, chapter 8, he talks about why the Jewish people believe in Moshe. If you think about it, our entire religion, I guess outside of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments we are from Hashem directly, but all of the laws of our religion, we heard from Moshe. We believe, we trust that he's not telling us anything of his own accord. It's all what he heard from the Almighty. But nevertheless, we are placing a lot of trust in Moshe. Maybe he's a fraud. Maybe he's a charlatan. Maybe he's lying. How do we know he's legit? That's the subject that the Rambam addresses. And he says, we do, do not believe in Moshe because of the miracles that he did. And the reason why is because if you believe in a prophet based upon miracles and signs and wonders that they do, you will always have a niggling suspicion and doubt. Maybe they used some sort of sorcery, some sort of black magic to produce that miracle. Trust that is established in a prophet based upon a miracle, there's always a little tiny bit of suspicion. Maybe there's some sort of trick, some sort of sorcery, some sort of magic. I don't know what it is. I don't know how they did it. But there's still room for doubt. And therefore, all the miracles that Moshe did were all based upon a certain need. Not to bring proof of prophecy. Not to bring proof that Moshe is different. It was based upon a need. The Egyptians surround the Jewish people and they're threatening to kill us. And we're surrounded by the water. We're completely trapped. So what does Moshe do? He splits the sea. Why does he do that? Not to prove his legitimacy, but to save the nation. And now we're in the wilderness and we need food or else we'll die. So Moshe gives us the manna and we're thirsty. If we don't have water, we'll die. So he hits the rock, and is able to emit water from the rock. And then there's the Korach rebellion, and there's a need to stamp out the insurrection. And Moshe performs the miracle, and the earth gobbles them up. All the miracles that Moshe did were all based upon a pressing need for the nation. It wasn't a standalone miracle to prove Moshe's legitimacy. So why, in fact, do we believe in Moshe? Says the Rambam, based upon this verse that we just quoted. At the Sinai revelation, we saw with our own eyes. We weren't told by someone else. We heard with our own ears. Fire, the sounds, pillars of fire. And Moshe is approaching the fire. And we listen in when God speaks to him. And we quote some verses, the verse in Devarim, chapter 5, God spoke to us face to face. We were prophets. God didn't give us some sort of tradition of the past. We witnessed ourselves. And he quotes the verse 99. The reason why we had the sign of relation was to prove via this higher level, not just prophecy based upon miracles and signs and wonders, but prophecy that is vetted, that is verified. Via co-prophecy, where an entire nation has national revelation and experiences prophecy alongside Moshe, that is why I believe in Moshe forever. So Rambam differentiates between the two types of verification of prophecy. You have prophecy verified upon a miracle. Some of this is a miracle, and we have no way to explain that based upon natural phenomena. Okay? This seems to prove that they are different. They are special. They are prophet. But that's a low level of verification. All the other prophets, they proved their credentials in that matter. Only Moshe had this higher level of verification done via co-prophecy. And therefore, Moshe's prophecy is an entirely different class. And if you want to contest the prophecy of Moshe, you are by definition a false prophet because no one else had such a type of verification. The only way someone can have the same level of credibility as Moshe, it's only if they too are vetted with a national revelation with co-prophecy of an entire nation. And that's not happening again. 
And therefore, we have faith in Moshe above all the prophets. He's the father of all the prophets. And that's why we get the Torah from Moshe, and we know it's from, from the Almighty. And that's why all the Torah comes from Moshe. He is the conduit of Torah. We know he's legit. So the idea of faith in Moshe as it's presented to the Torah, faith in the human, it makes a lot of sense. And you could say on a similar level, you know, we have to listen to the prophets, even other prophets, you know, Samuel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joshua. We believe in them because they are telling us the word of God. But how does this apply to other sages that are not prophets? We have a Mishnah that tells us, chapter 6, Mishnah 6, way number 24. You have to have faith in the sages. The sages is not just Moshe, it's not just prophets, the sages. That seems like a foreign idea. What does that mean, and why is that a portal through which we can acquire Torah? So there are a few different approaches to this concept. The verse tells us in Devarim, chapter 17, verse 11, that we have to listen to the council of elders, the Sanhedrin. There's the Supreme Court, and they are the final word of halacha. And when they render a ruling, it's an obligation, it's a mitzvah for us to listen to them. And we must not deviate or depart from what they say, not right and not left. Talmud tells us, even if they tell you the right is left, left is right, we must adhere to the rulings of the Sanhedrin. Typically, you know, we have critique and uh, we don't buy everything that we're told. And when someone tells you something that you could sense is wrong, there's no obligation to listen to them. I'm telling you right is left and left is right. Why would you listen to them? When it comes to the Sanhedrin, you have to accept their ruling, even if it sounds absurd. Now, does this mean that the Sanhedrin is infallible? After all, they're humans. And humans are prone to error. Even Moshe. Moshe made mistakes. The Torah details them. And yes, with Moshe, you can claim that because this is the initial transference of Torah, it was unperfectly, there was divine intervention to remove mistakes. But do we believe that there is some sort of papal-like infallibility to humans? Only God is perfect. Humans are imperfect. That's why we're humans. If we were perfect, we'd be God. If we were so, so, so perfect, we'd be like, a, like an angel. Even an angel is not the perfection of God. So Moshe, I can understand. Well, the Almighty says, I'm going to prevent any mistakes from, from happening. But what about subsequent sages? So there's a few ideas here. One idea the Talmud tells us that just as with Moshe, we know that his conveyance of Torah was perfect to us. Even subsequent sages, there is going to be divine intervention to prevent them from erring. The Talmud has some great stories about the animals of the great sages. The donkey of Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair. He had a donkey. And this donkey would refuse to eat non-kosher food. They offered him food. They were at a, an inn. They offered him food, and he refused to eat it. So said, well, maybe it's got some dust in it. Maybe it's got some pebbles in it. They removed all the pebbles and cleaned it up. He still didn't eat it. So they go to the great rabbi. Your animal's refusing to eat. So, well, did you tithe it? Is the food tithed? And he said, uh, well, no, I haven't tied it yet. Thought, well, he's not going to eat it. This is my animal. This is my donkey. And the Talmud gives another story about the famed donkey of Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair. It was once kidnapped. It was stolen. And the thief's like, yeah, great. We got this donkey. We stole it. It's great. It's, gonna, it's so sturdy. Look at it. This do great work for us. Let's feed it. And they give it some food. And refuses to eat. 
It's not going to eat any non-kosher food. And for three days, the animals refusing to eat. And the thieves say, well, I have no use for this carcass. It's going to die. Let me just release it. And the animal trudges back to its owner. And it arrives and it's famished. And some of the people in the household say, oh, we're going to feed it. And refuses to eat. So the great rabbi asks them, is it demai? Now, what is demai? So there's something called tevel, which means untithed grain. You have grain, you got to tithe. You got to give the, the truma to the coin and the maestro to the lady. You got to tithe it. Before you enjoy it, you got to tithe it. There are actually several tithes. But then you have the following situation. Suppose you buy grain from someone that you suspect did not tithe it. You don't know for sure it's untithed. It's not tevel. Tevel means for sure untithed. But you have very good reason to suspect this person not so fastidious. They're not so meticulous about tithing. So it may be tithed. It may be untithed. You don't know. And therefore, you are required to tithe it just to make certain that it's not untithed. But because it may in fact have been tithed, you don't know, it's called demai. It's a different class. Now, the law states, you are not allowed to feed your animal tevel. If it's untithed, you cannot feed it to your animal. But suppose you buy it from someone that you may suspect did not tithe it. If it's demai, not tevel, it's demai. It may be untithed. You are allowed to feed that to your animal. So they fed the famished donkey with demai. And the animal refused. So Rabbi Pinchas ben Yaris said, you know, my animal, it's very strict. Even though the law states that an animal can eat from demai, it wants to be more strict. It's stringent upon itself. You have to tithe it. So they tithed it and the animal ate it. And this is this legendary donkey that the Talmud tells us, the donkey of Rabbi Pinchas ben Yaris. What that means is that the holiness of the great sage actually influenced the animals as well. The animals wouldn't touch non-kosher. And they'd be extra stringent. The Talmud elsewhere, when it talks about the degradation of the generation, there's a line in the Talmud where one of the sages said, we are nothing compared to our great antecedents, our great predecessors. If they were like angels, then we're like humans. And if they are like humans, then we are like donkeys. But not the donkey of Rabbi Pichas Banyar. We're like ordinary donkeys. Now, here's the question. A donkey doesn't have a human brain, doesn't know the halacha. <clears throat> How does the donkey know about all these laws of tevel and demai and tithing and kosher? The Talmud tells us this is an example of the Almighty ensuring that even the animals of the righteous are not going to make blunders. The Talmud uses this story as an example of the principle that the Almighty is going to make sure that no mistakes are going to happen where someone who's righteous is going to do something which may be a violation. And if even the animals of these righteous people are making any mistakes, certainly you can trust that the, the sages themselves, the Almighty will prevent them from making mistakes that are beyond their control. So we have this idea, even outside of Moshe, outside of prophets, there is this idea of divine oversight. And perhaps you would say that, you know, Sanhedrin, these are great sages. And we have to trust them. They're not making a mistake. Well, but they're humans. Yes, they're humans. But perhaps the faith that we place in the Sanhedrin is well-founded. God will give them the divine guidance to ensure that they don't make a blunder. Now, of course, this doesn't happen on its own. 
they have to do a lot to make sure that they don't make the mistake themselves. There are all sorts of protections and, and safety measures to prevent mistakes. But there is this notion that the Almighty will aid those who are dedicated to pursuing the truth and will make sure that they won't make any mistakes. As an example of this, the most grave halachic dilemma when you have a halachic problem, you go to a great halachic arbiter, an authority. The most serious question that can ever come to the desk of a great halachic sage is the dilemma of an aguna. A married woman, there are only two ways that she can marry someone else. Either her husband dies or her husband delivers her a document of divorce or death. Suppose the husband disappears. We have no death certificate, no confirmation of their death, and there's no divorce document. But the husband is gone. Maybe the cartel got him. Maybe ISIS got him. Maybe they just died. They fell, in, fell into the river. We'll never know. If we have a body, we have some evidence. If we have a document of divorce, we don't need a body. What do you do in such a situation? Suppose soldiers go to war. Some of them get injured. Some of them die. And some of them are missing in action. We don't know what happened to them. There's explosions, and we just find a part of me for saying this. You just find a pile of limbs. You don't know whose is what. You don't know. Maybe you have a dog tag. Maybe you don't. Got pulverized. You don't know. People are missing. And you have very, very strong grounds to suspect that they died. But you don't have airtight proof. What do you do? This is a very, very serious problem. Because if the husband is actually alive, she is a married woman, and that's adultery. And those kids may be born from a subsequent marriage are bastards, are mamzer. What do you do? These are the most serious questions that could ever appear in a halachic nature, and they always go to the great sages. In recorded history, we have no example of a great halachic authority ruling that a woman is permitted to remarry based upon evidence that's not airtight. If the guy's actually dead and we have a body, we know, we know that they're dead. But there were times, like in war, you have testimony of friends, you have a little pile of organic matter. You don't have anything. Today you have DNA testing, so maybe that helps. But there's never been an instance in all of documented history where the man shows up and she's got a whole new family with her new husband and the man, the husband shows up. It's never happened. And the kinds of ideas that, or, or halachic arguments that are presented are sometimes very tenuous. And they don't sound very persuasive. But nevertheless, there is this idea that if someone is a great sage, the Almighty will prevent them from making mistakes. And if they rule that the husband is dead, the husband is dead. And if he's not dead, he's, he's going to die right away. He has to be dead. Because the Almighty will not allow a great sage to make such a blunder. So that's perhaps one way to look at this idea of treating the Sanhedrin as if they have infallibility. We can rely on them because the Almighty will ensure that they are correct. I will note there is another way of looking at this. The Sefer Chinuch, so that's the book that we're using in our mitzvah series. So now we're in the ethics series. But the Sefer Chinuch in mitzvah number 496, the mitzvah to adhere to the ruling of the Sanhedrin, he says something very novel. He says, Let's assume the Sanhedrin is not infallible and they may make mistakes. 
And notwithstanding all the safety measures and all the protections that we have in place to prevent those mistakes from happening, mistakes may happen. Nevertheless, we must follow their ruling because if we don't, we cease to have a religion. If there's no final word that renders a ruling that's final, we no longer have a functioning religion. It's going to start to splinter and it's going to go in different places. And that is way worse than having one mistake. And therefore, even if we can tolerate the idea that the center is not infallible, they may make mistakes, nevertheless, we follow them. And that's another way to look at this idea of trust in sages. We trust them. Maybe they're 100% right, or maybe they're even wrong. That's the system that has to be in place. Otherwise, we don't have a religion. We know that tradition is very central to our religion. Historically, we have always been very wary, very suspicious of any innovation. You know, our religion has survived a very, very, very long time under very difficult, precarious circumstances. And you know, many times someone has an improvement, so to speak, that deviates even an inch away from the tradition of our ancestors, it's always going to be treated with great suspicion. Even if it's a good idea, it's a logical idea, it's sensible. Nevertheless, tradition is very important and we trust our sages. So this is some of the ideas that are featured about this notion to trust the sages in general. Now, in our Mishnah, this idea is being used as a way to acquire Torah, as a way to improve our studying. How does trust in our sages improve our studying? I get that it improves the religion, and yes, we need it for, for we need it to trust Moshe for Torah. But how does this help me to acquire? Well, how is this a method to acquire Torah? It's not immediately obvious, and I want to suggest an approach. If you have ever had the great privilege of studying in a yeshiva, you'll note that the method that's used in the yeshiva is very unusual. You study a piece of Talmud. You study one of the great commentators, Rashi, Tosfos, the Rashba, etc. Or you study a work in Rambam. You never consider the possibility that the Talmud, that the commentaries, that the Rambam made an elementary mistake. If you think about the Rambam, I always, always marvel at the fact just how much the Rambam accomplished in his lifetime. My grandfather, blessed member, used to say, if the Gentiles had the Rambam, they would have deified him. Because a human cannot conceive of another human doing so much and being so incredible. Like, how many people would it take to recreate his writings from scratch? Think about what he, what he does. Think about the scope of this project. In what, only one of his projects. Like he, remember, he was the first person to write a commentary on all of uh, the works of the Mishnah. 63 books of Mishnah. He was the first one to write a comprehensive commentary on all of them, all 63 books, and he did that as a teenager. Just get a sense. For a thousand years, no one was able to do it. It's too big. It's too vast. As a teenager, he wrote a commentary on all of Mishnah, all 63 books that incorporates the Talmud, that incorporates everything. This is at a completely different level. But then the Mishnah Torah, okay? The way he himself defines this work is that this work contains all of oral Torah. So Mishnah, Talmud, Midrash, everything. Everything, 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 everything. It's all incorporated into one set of 14 books. How many thousands, tens of thousands of people working day and night for centuries would it take to recreate that? And you're reading a piece. And it seems obvious that he made an elementary error. It's obvious to you. You have the Talmud. 
And the Rambam is saying something which contradicts the works of the Talmud. And it's obvious. Now, the Rambam cannot argue with the Talmud. It's not possible. Because he's going to give you all the rulings that come from the Talmud. And he just organizes it with the bottom line. You read the Talmud, and you find the corresponding piece in the Rambam, and they just don't match. They don't match. So what do you do? Another example that appears thousands of times in the Talmud. On a standard page of Talmud, you'll have in the inner margin, you have the commentary of Rashi. And on the outer margin, you have the commentary of Tosvos. Tosvos was written by a compilation of sages. Many of them were descendants of Rashi. But invariably, the Tosvos begins its commentary by quoting Rashi and almost always challenging it and questioning it. And very often the question is so sharp. It's so unassailable. You're like, what was Rashi thinking? This, there's no wiggle room for Rashi. So you have a Ramam that's problematic. You have a Rashi that's problematic. You have something that does make sense. You have two choices. You can dismiss it. The Rambam made a mistake. The Rashi made a blunder. That's what you could do. Or you do what we do in yeshiva. You apply the principle of trust the sages. The Talmud has credibility. The Rambam, Rashi, they have credibility. You have to trust them. They had knowledge and depth of understanding that we cannot fathom. And we give them a degree of credibility. And that's the beginning of our study. That's not the end. We don't stop. We demand upon ourselves to say, okay, this Rambam and this Talmud are compatible. I just don't know how. And I try to put myself in the shoes of the Rambam and say, I'm going to figure it out. And that is how you hitch your wagon to the Rambam to study the depths of Torah. You missed something, he didn't. Or your understanding of the Talmud is different than his understanding for whatever reason that you have to figure out. And now you have an opportunity, you have a portal to understand it on a much deeper level. We trust our sages. What does it take to become a great sage? It takes commitment and dedication and selflessness and years of toil in study day and night. To be a real sage, you have to be selfless. You have to have complete devotion and dedication and commitment and mastery of, of, over all of Torah. And then you read it and it says something completely baffling. Have faith. Have trust. Accord them some credibility. And try to figure out, okay, I'm assuming that this Ramam is correct. I will not say that he made a mistake. Now let me try to understand it from their viewpoint. Let me try to reconcile what they say with what the sources that they are working off are saying. And again, this is a, a totally different way of studying. And by doing this, effectively, you're finding a shortcut to the depths of Torah. You're trying to study the Talmud with the same level of profundity as the Rambam. It's a shortcut to plumbing the depths of Torah. You're acknowledging, it takes a little bit of, of humility, but you're acknowledging that your misunderstanding or your lack of understanding of how the Rambam is compatible with the Talmud is a reflection of your shallowness of understanding and the different dimension, the profound depth of his. You're giving him some trust. You're trusting him. And by doing that, you are leveling up. You're exposing yourself to an entirely different way of, of learning, of understanding, of studying. And you get to work. And you read the sources very, very carefully. And you read them really, really, really carefully. And you said every stage of the back and forth. What is the question? 
What is the answer? What part of the question, what assumption of the question is the, is the answer addressing? And what about the proof? How exactly is the proof serving to buttress the answer? And you, you work really hard. It, it could take a day, a week, a month, or even longer. But if you work hard enough and you commit your mind hard enough, you will reconcile that Rambam and that Talmud. And then you're going to find evidence that you're right. You look at the precise words of the Rambam and the precise reading of the Talmud and maybe some other Talmuds that you weren't even aware of. Because the Rambam, of course, didn't cite his sources, which made it such a thrilling ride. And you're going to find evidence that you, your understanding was correct. And now you've gotten a little tiny window. You've taken a little, a little submersible and survived. You're, you're, you're going down to the, the depths of the seas of the Torah. And how did it all start? It started with some trust. You trust the sages. Our instinct to say, oh, I, I read it. I, I, I stand, I read it even twice. And I read the Ramam, and they're not compatible. You gotta trust the sages. Their level of understanding is something you cannot even fathom. I'll, I'll tell you what I read over Shabbos. I read a story. Listen to this The Gon of Vilna once made a remark that every person has to know at least one book of Talmud by heart because otherwise if you don't have a book in front of you what are you studying you're supposed to study Torah day and night how are you supposed to study if you don't know at least one thing by heart so there's a very famous rabbi that heard that he says you know what I am going to study one book of Talmud by heart so he studied the book of Sukkah which talks about Sukkah the, the festival of Sukkot and the, the four species that we shake on Sukkos, on Sukkos, studied it again and again until he knew it by heart. And on the intermediate days of the festival, he found himself in the Sukkah visiting the Gona Vilna. And he was so proud of himself. I actually did it. And he tells the Gona Vilna, I, I actually did it. I studied the whole the whole book by heart. He says, yeah, would you mind if I test you? Would you mind if I test you? He says, sure. He says, how many times in the book does Rabbi Yehud and Rabbi Meir argue? How many times in the book does Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Tarfan argue? How many times in the book does Rabbi and Rabbi Yosef argue? How many times in the book does Abai and Rava argue? How many times does Rashi and Tosfos argue? Even if you know something by heart, you don't know, you don't know it that well. And then says the Gona Vilna, if you look at how the word sukkah is spelled in the Torah, it's spelled in two different ways. It's spelled samach vav chafhei, which is how you would spell it if you were writing the vowels in the form of letters. And it's spelled samach chafhei which is how you would spell it if you're not writing the vowels as letters, but in fact, they are nekudos. Do you know why the Torah spells the word sukkah sometimes like this and sometimes like that? Because the gematria of sukkah without a vav is 85, and the gematria of sukkah with a vav is 91. If you study the whole book of sukkah, the Talmudic tractate of sukkah, and it describes all different types of sukkahs, you'll notice that 85 of them are descriptions of sukkahs that are not kosher. And 91 of them are descriptions of sukkahs that are, in fact, kosher. And therefore, when it has an extra letter, then it is, it's, it's bigger, it's grander, it's fuller. That is an indication of it being kosher. And then when it's lacking the letter, that's an indication of it not being kosher. Can you list all 85 instances in the whole book 
where the final result of the analysis is that it's not kosher, and all 91 instances when it is kosher. And this is the goat of Vilna. Didn't live so long ago, 250 years ago, 220 years ago, he lived. This is a level of mastery we can't even fathom. The Rambam is 500 years prior. It's that plus, 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 plus. If you read it and you say, oh, they made a mistake, I, I read it. You're, 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 you're a fool. You're not understanding what kind of people we're dealing with over here. Trust the sages. You want to understand a little bit of Torah in its depth? You want to take a little trip down to the depths of Torah? You want to really get a sense of, of a little inkling, a tiny little window, 0.0001% of 1%, of 1%, of 1%, of the level of these sages? Trust them. And then, and then follow their logic and follow the reasoning and find out how they're saying something true. Oh, Rashi says something, and then Tosos argues. Do you think that Rashi did not have a response to Tosos' question? He didn't know the Talmud that they cited? We're, we're dealing with sages. It's not possible for them to not know a, a teaching in the Talmud. And they knew it, and they said it nonetheless. And you have to figure out why. And if you do, it's a way to acquire Torah. Not just to read it, to understand it, but to go deep, deeper than you would be able to go otherwise. Even in modern times, our sages get some degree of trust, of credibility. The great Rabbi Chaim Salavechik passed away in 1918, so it's a little more than a century ago, relatively recently. He wrote a very famous work, his commentary on the Rambam. And this is, I think it's 150 or so pieces where he takes a Rambam and he does this process. A Rambam, and if there's a problem, there's a problem. It doesn't add up, it doesn't reconcile. It, it's not congruent with the sources. And he resolves it with, with brilliance, with genius. Now again, if we, if someone's a novice and they wanted to even study one of those pieces, they would need probably at least a month just to prepare to understand the concepts and to understand the, the subject matter before you even read the Rambam and you know, just, just to get a basic background understanding of what we've been talking about. But it's, it, it's, a, it's a modern work, and it does this. And there have been many, many works written on the Rambam. Again, the Rambam made it interesting for us because he didn't cite sources. So the sources could be anywhere in all of oral Torah. Good luck finding it. So Rabbi Chaim Salavechik wrote once an essay on a difficult passage in Rambam. And he cited the question, and he offered a novel answer, and he finished his piece. The problem is, is that his citation, or his explanation, conflicts with a teaching of the Talmud. So you want to resolve the Rambam with the Talmud, but if that resolution now conflicts with a different teaching of the Talmud, then you're back to square one. And someone raised this problem with the son of Rabbi Salavechik, who was also called Rabbi Salavechik. They said to him, wait a minute, your father writes this whole beautiful essay and it's great, but the Talmud says otherwise. And he's studying his father's writing. He's like, oh, we got a problem here. My father's writing doesn't seem to, his reconciliation of the Rambam is great with the Rambam, but there's another teaching in the Talmud that seems to fly in the face of that reasoning. So he tried to reconcile it, and he could not resolve it. And then he said, I guarantee you that when my father was writing this essay, this Talmud that you are citing as a contradiction to what he was writing, it was open on the desk before him. I guarantee it. I don't know what his reconciliation was, but I trust that he had a reconciliation. We're talking about sages. 
the, the Mishnah tells us, Emunas Chacham, sages, trust the sages. These are heavyweights. And they're not in it for some sort of agenda that they're trying to push, some sort of political stuff. They're completely committed to the truth. And if you don't understand their position, afford them some credibility. Consider, just consider. There may be something that you are unaware of, that you are ignorant of. You may be operating on too shallow of a plane. And maybe it's your job to look deeper. And if you do, you may have the opportunity to level up your understanding of Torah. Way number 24, to trust the sages. As always, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I look forward to your questions, your comments, and your feedback. Okay, who wants to, who wants to jump in here first? We'll be first. Just open your mic and talk. Yes, go ahead. I didn't hear what you said. Were you talking to me? Oh, I, I, I just uh, just said, if anybody has something, just open your mic and talk. Yes, okay. Looks like we lost some people along the way. Yeah, it looks like it. It is kind of late. Yeah, but that's all right. People got busy things to do. I just lucked out. All of my grandkids are out of the house right now. So I have a question. It's Leslie. Can you Hi. give an example um, that the different rabbis are disagreeing? You said sometimes they disagree with the original person that wrote it. Rambam wrote it. And then there were people that disagreed. And you were talking about something like that a little while ago. You want an example? Yeah, you, you said that. How long are you willing to listen in so I can give you an example? Uh, my phone is charged. I'm 81%, so I'm okay. Should we do that once? I don't know if we should do that. Rabbi, it's totally suffice it to it. say, suffice it to say, it's it's um it would be hard to give a real example of this. Because again, you have the students in Yeshiva, they're studying the, the Talmud 10 hours a day. Mm. You know, and they could spend a week on one of these problems, maybe even more. And these are people that are schooled in the ways of, of Talmudic reasoning and logic. So it's very hard for me to give you an example, um, okay. just in this forum. Um, but it, it's, um, it is the bread and butter of what we do, what the people who have the great privilege of being in yeshiva do. Okay. So, anyone else wants to chime in? Chime. Anybody want to challenge? Yeah, challenge. The idea. Who's first? Rabbi, I have a question. It's a little off topic, but what you mentioned about, um, this is Paul, by the way. Yeah, of course. Uh, the uh, I, wrote, I wrote you in my notes, by the way. You're in my notes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> because you, um, you gave me a suggestion that, uh, that uh, when we talked about the, the red heifer, we got to burn it outside. Yes. So you said that's David, and I said oh, David. David's a redhead, so it's in my yes. notes. So it's called a Paul Parish addendum. <laughs> I'm honored. Yeah. You go ahead, Paul. Well, this this is uh, uh, actually uh, around a question about David also, and that um, in the incident with Uriah, that. The practice, I guess, at the time was to give your wife a divorce document. Yes. Yeah. I was just wondering, is that still a practice employed by no. Jewish soldiers? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I think I try to remember if, if it was ever done in, in recent memory. I don't think it was. It's not really done today. So, okay. no. and then that's my knowledge. Let me clarify that. Not to my knowledge. Okay. Yeah, I guess if someone went into a very dangerous, um, um, like, uh, operation, maybe that would, and there's a real risk of them 
getting kidnapped or being missing in action, you know, they go to Syria or something like that. Maybe they would do it. They say, you know, if I'm not back by this date, then the divorce, the way they do it is, if I'm not back by this and this date, then the divorce document is activated. Well, because if they do come back, then they might still want to stay with their wife, right? Yeah. Okay, who else wants to uh, chime in? Wow. I, I silenced all the critics. You, you stunned, I resolved all the dilemmas. I answered all the questions. <laughs> I guess we finished. At the, this is like the last tour class. Have you answered everything? If not, uh, we got to do more it. more things we still need to cover, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Sandy has something that she wants to say. I'm sure. Sure. Maybe not. I don't know. One day she now, might surprise as often us. happens, you answered the question as I was writing it um, about if I follow a Sanhedrin ruling, that is a mistake. Would I be held responsible for my actions? But if I understood you, it, it would not be possible that they are prevented from giving an incorrect ruling. Yeah, well, again, there, there were two approaches. There's one idea that they are given divine intervention, therefore they will not give a, a raw ruling. And one idea is that even if they do, it's better for you to follow them. So you're definitely not held accountable if you follow the ruling. The Torah says you have to follow the ruling. And the Torah says follow the ruling if, even if it's right. They tell you right is left and left is right. So that seems to imply that they're telling you even if the ruling is incorrect, you follow them. So you're not held responsible. I will tell you, there is a law we have not gotten to it yet, I believe. I don't think we got to it yet. That states that set, that states that if someone, if a Sanhedrin makes a ruling that uh, results in the majority of the nation doing idolatry, which it's very hard to fathom that something like that would happen. But if Sanhedrin makes an incorrect ruling that results in the uh, majority of the nation doing idolatry, then the the the, uh, the nation has to bring a sacrifice. The special sacrifice the nation has to bring. But um, you would not be held accountable for, for that in the event that uh, you follow what the Sanhedrin says. They made a mistake. It's not your, it's, that's not your fault. It most likely won't happen. But e even if we could fathom that a mistake would happen, uh, it would not, you, would, you would not be held liable for it. In fact, you would be held liable if you don't listen to them. So when the Sanhedrin is reestablished, who will decide who those people will be how how is that how was that determined then and how will it be determined uh, it, it, this is based upon aptitude um uh, we we have a mitzvah coming up in our mitzvah series that talks about what um the the requirement to have a sanhedrin uh, it's i don't know exactly which mitzvah number it is but it's it's upcoming uh we'll learn more about what the qualifications are uh safe to say uh, they are very 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 intense uh, just as an example the Sanhedrin can never hear testimony from a translator. Right. Because language is not always exactly precise. Not always exactly precise. And therefore, the person speaks in Spanish. And you, don't, you don't understand Spanish. You cannot be part of Sanhedrin. You have to know all the languages. One of the requirements is you got to know all 70 languages. That's even before Torah, right? That's just a requirement. You have to be healthy. You have to be old, but not too old. If you're too old, then uh, the the Talmud says, if you're too old, you can be a little cranky. You know, you know, you know the get off my lawn types. <laughs> if you're too old, you, you don't have enough compassion. You, you're not qual you're not qualified. Uh, you have to have children. The Talmud tells us why, because it means you have an extra degree of empathy. You also have to know everything. Everything. Not only that, the Sanhedrin uh, was comprised of 71 sages. But there were also three, um, three groups of 23 sages apiece that were apprentices. So effectively, in, this, in the room of the Sanhedrin, there were 140 people. You have the, uh, the 71 sages that are on the Sanhedrin, and then you have the 69 apprentices. And the way it works is after, let's say, someone retires or dies from the Sanhedrin, 
the most senior of the 69 sages joins the Sanhedrin. And everyone moves up a notch. So 68, but you know, uh, uh, 69 becomes 68, and 68 becomes 67, and 67, etc. And then two becomes one, and they find the most qualified candidate to become number 69 of the uh, of the apprentice court, so to speak. So by the time that someone makes it to the Sanhedrin, not only are they the greatest sage in the land that was not part of the Sanhedrin when they were selected, but there have been 69 retirements or deaths, at least, maybe even more. Well, no, because I guess if someone who's part of the apprentice court dies, then they would jump up. But there's got to be many, 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 many years, you would imagine, between when they join the lower court until they actually make it to the upper court. So they have a lot of training. They have a lot of training because they study as well. They continue to advance in their scholarship uh, uh, over the course of, of that uh, of that period. So again, uh, you know, you you have to be a real, real, real sage. I, I, I'll tell you a cool story. Um, part of the requirement is you have to be healthy. In modern times, we had sages that knew all of Torah, even in modern times like unbelievable sages you can't believe that you're part of the same species as these people they know so much like how are we the same thing at all like <laughs> we, we have you know i'm like the donkey not the donkey or i'm like the other donkey just, or compared to them i'm just a, I'm, I'm a donkey so one of the great sages his name was rabbi moshe feinstein and he was undergoing a certain procedure and he was very, very curious, very uh, adamant that he understood exactly what they're doing, because he was worried that in the that if the surgery was so, was such that it would invalid, he was worried about being invalidated as being a member of the Sanhedrin, because he was someone who was qualified, unbelievable, he was qualified, and he was worried that uh, um, that, that that it should not in the event the temple's rebuilt right away and. You know, he would I mean, be an obvious candidate to be part of the Sanhedrin. Um, he shouldn't have a, an ailment that would render him uh, ineligible for being part of the Sanhedrin. Okay. Anyone else wants to uh, share something or ask a question? Are you... Uh, Rabbi, are you officially back? Or are you still on holiday? I'm not on holiday, but I'm not back. Okay, I'm just working remotely. Okay, from a, a, a undisclosed location north of the border. Secret. Yes. Secret. So you have to have like special clearance. I'm in, I'm in, a, I'm in a bunker with uh, all sorts of gardeners. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're we're, we're going to be uh, away from Houston for um, for the summer. Wow, you're going to be missed, but I can't. I, I admire you working the whole time too. So I work to, more here. I know, but you should take some time. You should take some time as well. Well, I will do that as, as soon as you take off time from breathing. Oh, okay. I'll work on that in a few years. You take <laughs> off time from oxygen. I'll take off time from ox towards oxygen. So. <laughs> Whatever no, I'm not studying, not mind. studying. I'm not talking about study. you got to study. Okay? Oh, okay. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about messing so with is oxygen. oxygen and yeah, you can't do without that. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah absolutely. absolutely right. I, hope, I hope you don't stop breathing for a very long time. <laughs> God that. willing. 120. Yes. Okay, everyone, uh, anyone else? Just last chance. Jump in. Don't be shy. This is an admin note tonight, six. I mean, tonight is chapter six of, of um, the book of Ezekiel, right? No. Nehemia. Nehemia, yeah. Uh, it's going to be at 3, 3 p.m. Take care, everyone. Have a great week. Bye-bye. I'll Have see a you next wonderful week. Wonderful week. Bye-bye.